All right, so this week we're going to go over the history of forensic science into the development of where forensic science is now and a little bit about law. So forensics comes from the Latin word forensis, which means forum. So basically, as far back as anyone has records of people to solve a criminal case started off initially as like no science, no science at all backing up basically. So we have like, we have records of Romans would get together. Someone would accuse someone of a crime and basically there'd be a public forum. What that means is like they would speak in front of a crowd and basically the two parties would, you know, accuse and the other person would say, no, I didn't do it. Um, obviously more technical than that, but that's literally it. They would talk back and forth. And then after hearing the two sides of the story, the public that was there would decide if they were guilty or not. So like that's is specific as they got back then there was no science no proving and it was just listening to the two sides of the story now if we move up kind of the same time frame the earliest on record that we have have anything scientific is in 13th century china so the first case ever recorded where forensic science was used was someone was stabbed in a village in china and they made everyone in the village to, like turn in any of their weapons so anything that could have been used to stab someone was thrown out in front of everyone and then they just let them sit there and kind of watch and basically the, there was flies that kept being attracted to one knife and the suspect sees this and confesses just like oh man they've caught me and at this point in time like that would have been kind of like it would have probably worked because they didn't have bleach they didn't have good soaps so there actually probably was still blood residue on his knife even if he had rinsed it off now that's our first case that we have on record with science being used, but I mean, really we continued to not use science for a long time after that. So it didn't really start being, start being used at all, like any kind of science being used at all on a regular basis till the 1800s. So this is Matthew Orphelia. This is about 200 years ago, and he is considered to be the father of forensic toxicology. So not the father of forensic science, the father of forensic toxicology, because he was the first chemist who published the first scientific paper on how to detect poisons and their effects on animals. So um, during this time frame, about 200 years ago, up until on 100 years ago, probably, maybe even a little later, it was really, really easy to poison someone and get away with it because there was very few people who studied toxicology and had any idea of how to detect poisons in a deceased person. It was really, really hard to tell. And some of them we had no test for at all. So basically in 1814, Matthew Ophelia was one of the first ones that started trying to prove that um, he could test for poisons inside a corpse. Now it still was a very rudimentary process, was not great tests. Um, it did not get better for quite some time after this, but he started it. So one of the first cases, what is, keeps clicking off of it, that we have of his is Mary Lafarge. So this was a very popular um, crime case when it was around. So during 1816, 1852, um, she was, she was, so that's when she died, 1852. She was charged in 1840. So this would have been when um, Matthew Orphelia was already pretty popular. People trusted his ability to find poisons. And this woman was a young woman who was married to a man who she didn't want to be married to. She'd already tried to like get a divorce, but that wasn't allowed at the time. And basically she poisoned him with arsenic. And because of the fact that she was like a woman of like high class and the fact that she was a woman that was on trial made it a very popular case. So it was, you know, everyone was paying attention to it. Now he did his tests on arsenic. That was kind of like what he's best known for is had a test for arsenic in a body. And he found that the arsenic that she had on in her house matched the arsenic in high doses in her husband's body. So she was convicted. So we started to understand how to test for poisons all the way back to 1840, which is like a hun almost 150 years ago, or I guess a little more than 150 years ago. How do you math? <laughs> Now we're moving up in time. So it was 1840. Um, now we're into 1879. And we have Alphonse Bertillon. Now he's the father of criminal identification. So 
again, anytime I say a father of something, like they're probably going to come up on a quiz or a test to match who they are. Um, you're going to hear a lot about Bertillion this week. We have an article and a lab on him. Um, he did other things, not just criminal identification, but that is what he is the father of. He developed a system called anthropometry. So anthropometry anthropometry um, uses body measurements to distinguish an individual individual so this this um, set of measurements you can see these pictures this is what would happen when a um, criminal was taken in so when they were taken into custody they would take all these measurements and they would write them down in this Bertillion measurement chart right here and other things too but this is how we basically identified people from each other was we wrote down all their measurements and basically assumed that there wouldn't be a person who would have the exact measurements in all the categories like maybe they have these two things the same but they're not going to have everything the same and that was a system that we used for a long time this was pre-fingerprints um there was already some knowledge about fingerprints being unique but not enough that anybody was really using it this was the system for a really long time now when we stopped using this system is because of this story right here so um, you're gonna hear more about this in the article that you're gonna read so I don't want to tell you too much about it but you see these two pictures here these two pictures here are of two different men <laughs> um, you can tell a little bit here more from the side profile that their faces are slightly different um, and they're like right around like the forehead region it looks slightly different but one was named will west and the other one went by william west so they had the same name basically they look exactly the same they took these two prisoners in at different time frames but they ended up being in the same prison and they had the exact same measurements so it was kind of like basically it was like an eye-opening moment for us for criminal identification we had been using that same method for a very long time and then realized that like I, there actually are people out there that you would call a doppelganger so in being that they exist like they're right here um, people have the exact same measurements it's probably not going to be the system that we can continue to use so after we had this kind of fail realizing that they had the same measurements the same name like so crazy they weren't related at all um we had to switch to fingerprints so basically this marks the the moment when we had to finally move into fingerprinting being our main way to identify people until we get to dna way later in life So now just moving up in time frames, you can see that we're now we're getting closer to 1900. Um, I'll kind of skip over Henry Falls. So we, we had to switch to fingerprints. Um, Henry Falls uses fingerprints to eliminate a suspect in 1880. So we already had to do a pretty quick turnaround with using them. And then Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, I do bring him up usually on quizzes and tests because people usually can remember his name. Um, he was the author of Sherlock Holmes. Now that doesn't seem like it's super important, but he actually made a pretty big wave. So before 1887, or really even continuing on after this a little bit, um, but definitely pre-1887, all the 1800s, science, even though it was starting to be used and some people knew about it and knew how to make tests and things, it was not heavily used. In fact, it was kind of frowned upon. There were, I mean, and you got to think about the kind of people that are existing now. They were not highly educated. Hardly anyone was educated. And if they were educated, we're talking like reading and writing. Um, they weren't being taught about how to catch criminals through science. But with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, he created this story, Sherlock Holmes, and it became a really popular series. Like a lot of people love these books and why that mattered was basically people finally were starting to see the CSI um, using science to catch bad guys, to find all the evidence. They started seeing it as something that should be happening before that. Um, no one just really thought about using evidence, which is like, it sounds crazy to us, but this really was the beginning of when we thought that you shouldn't be able to solve a crime unless you have the evidence to back it up. So basically he like started popularizing it.